to the floor, settle in, and begin your own internal process of scanning. So you all have become familiar enough with this process. And I, I've been sharing, and I shared at the beginning of this call, this new way we are learning, which is virtual, because it's the safest, and we need to be safe. It's really a process of not being told, do it this way or do it that way, but through comparisons and allowing someone that is a little bit more informed to help suggest possibilities so that you can choose for yourself what is serving you best versus somebody tells you what you should feel or it should be. We're the same and we are different. And how to be comfortable in our differences and better begin to hone our skills and our abilities how to listen how to be able to transition ourselves to a better place. And then, like a treasure hunt, we'll lose it and we find it again. We become more adept at how to do that. And when we become more adept, everybody in our realm begins to feel that resonance, begins to want to find that path for themselves. Notice your contact. So I'm going to continue on the theme of translations. And I, I loved the play on words. So there are translations that mean, how do you take some communication in one language and enable another person to understand your intention? And some of the languages we speak in this world, the words are not exactly translatable. For instance, the Eskimos have 20 words for different types of snow. We have one word, the Americans, snow. But each word explains a quality. There are other languages that have multiple words when you're talking about love. And each way they say a word or, or have a word that describes love, it has a different interpretation. You've got to have a sense of humor when you don't quite understand and you use the wrong term and somebody looks at you with a puzzled eye like, what? And then they clarify and you laugh. Oh, well, what should I say when I intend that? Now, translation, Dr. Feldenkrais was an engineer, a physicist, and that's someone who takes structure, which is the engineer, into movement. He was also a nuclear scientist, responsible for sonar and nuclear fusion with the Curies at the Sorbonne. There's a movie, Lost in Translation, I love that movie, where things just, they don't get understood. And especially where we're using words and we come from a different way of interpreting the word, the intention. It's so important to clarify, did they really understand what I intended? And I will always be apologetic when I did not communicate the intention I intended. So translations. In this term, it means a physical movement that stays on the same plane of action. But that plane of action can be in a different plane as long as it stays constant. Then we have the confusion, we're a human skeleton. Well, we could even talk about any animal. And 
we have no straight lines. So a translation in movement is going to have a little bit of an arc. However, when you explore these movements of translation, and we're going to do many today in different orientations, I thought I'd give a rest from lying on the belly today because it's not always comfortable for everybody. I want to clarify what is a translation. And when you make a translation where you initiate the translation movement, notice how it's different. So notice your contact with the floor. And slowly, choose which side you would be most comfortable to lie on and listen to your process of how you roll onto that side. How you breathe, is it a one movement of rolling or is it many oops, pushes, holds? What do you do? No judgment, just notice. And when you come to your side, use whatever support you might need to start. Maybe you use your bottom arm as a pillow to rest your head on. Maybe you use head supports. Just notice how you're going to start. I'm going to give you a few movements we call translations on a side. And some of you are going to go, oh, that's a translation? Have your hips and knees bent ballpark 90 degrees. And then create that image of a, oh, we'll say a little string that's tied around your ankles. Now notice what you'd like to do with your top hand. Is it resting alongside your upper side, your hip? Is it resting on the floor in a push-up position? Is it resting long in front of you? These are three possibilities. Just notice what you start with. And now very slowly, listening to how you do this, begin to glide and slide your top hip and knee a little bit forward of the bottom knee and then return it to its neutral. And do the smallest amount so that you can keep this movement of gliding and sliding your top hip and knee in relationship to the bottom as clean as you can without starting to really be rolling a lot. You are creating a differentiation. So if you notice, oh, all of me is rolling more in the direction of my belly, maybe use your top hand in a push-up position on the floor that creates a little bit of constraint and create the intention that it's really the top hip and knee that is going to glide a little forward of the bottom, but keep that little ribbon, imaginary ribbon, tied around your ankles so that one foot doesn't flop off of the other one. And a translation is moving one part a little bit in one direction, forward or back. And I'm asking you to, to limit the amount of rotation that could occur in your spine when you're not thinking about it and you go further to make it a luscious rolling movement. I'm asking shy of the rolling. It's a differentiation. Where do you feel it? But notice that your top leg is translating a little forward and back. Listen to the relationship with the bottom leg. Listen to how you breathe. For most, this is a very basic, rudimentary movement we do in Feldenkrais lessons we start you with. And this is a translation of the top leg parallel, for the most part, to the bottom leg, to the floor, moving slowly a little forward. And then as you return it, see if you can slide it a little back, but only to the place where the leg itself does not change the plane it is moving in. The plane right now, I'm going to call, I'm going to keep it as simple as possible, a table, a table plane, a horizontal plane. You're moving a little horizontally forward with that top hip and knee, 
and a little back. But you're reducing the amount of movement so that it doesn't begin to change which plane you are moving in. The minute you start to feel, oh, I'm really rolling as if I could roll more towards my belly, do less. Keep it as clean as you can. It's a translation. A true translational movement isn't huge. It's smaller. And then pause and rest. Now, for those where it's possible, and it may not be possible for everybody, see if you can elongate your top arm, I'm sorry, I take that back, your bottom arm, your bottom arm, elongate it and use that as the pillow you rest your head on. See if it's possible. And can you keep the arm elongated so that it's really straight on the vertical? You're aligning your head, neck, and spine on a long vertical line, whereas your hips and knees are bent on a horizontal plane. See if it's possible. Now remember I said, mm, once we start moving in a human structure, there are no straight bones. So there's going to be a subtle little shift. In fact, don't try to do your best. The minute you start to feel you would change the plane of action, you return your head to rest on top of the bottom long arm. Slowly. Lift your head the smallest amount. It's so small that it doesn't really have to change the plane. Just enough that it clears your arm. And transfer, translate your head to come in front of the arm and if possible to lay the head on the floor in front of the arm. And then bring the head up and put it back on top of the long arm. Yeah, that's beautiful. I saw somebody take a pad so that when they transferred, translated their head off of their arm to move it onto the floor in front of them, they elevated the floor. They created a little bit of an artificial floor so that the head didn't have to drop to the floor as much. Whatever side of your face is resting on the long arm will rest on the artificial floor you've increased in front of your arm or if you lower that side of your face towards the floor. And that would also be a translational movement. Because you're still looking forward. Don't turn your nose, your eyes to look to the floor. Where you look when the head is resting on top of your long arm is where you look to the best of your ability. If it's difficult to lay the face on the floor, build it up with towels or pads. You just translated your head forward. That's a translational movement. But feel what happens in your shoulder blades. Where do you put the top arm? Is it in a push-up position or is it resting on top of your hip? Where would it be most advantageous for you in this exploration? Good. Now pause a moment and listen to what I'm going to ask next. Because you may say, oh, in order for me to do that and really stay in a more translation relationship, while well, I can listen to my spine, listen to what's changing, you might want to put some of those pads you just put in front of your arm, in front of your face on the floor, behind your head. Because I'm going to ask you to also gently lift your head in just enough that you can translate it back as if it wants to lie on the floor back behind that long arm. Not so simple. For more than not, the nose wants to turn towards the ceiling. But if I said, you're really going to do it smaller, not strive, you're just going to play, what if? You put those pads back there so that you just lifted your head and placed them a little further beyond your arm that you were resting on, but your face is still towards the front. So if you want to have enough pads or pillows in front of your face 
and behind your head, you could begin to transfer, translate. Your head, you exhale maybe just a little so that you can lift the head just enough to bring it and translate it forward and rest on the floor, rest on the pads or pillows just in front of your long arm. Then you return your head back onto the long arm in neutral. And then you translate the back of your head, still looking forward, back. And feel what happens in your spine, your shoulder blades, your chest. It's moving through you, but you have a constraint. You are purposefully creating. Good. Now, let that go. Maybe bring your hand again to rest on the floor in a push-up position and return into the movement of gliding and sliding in a translational pattern. Your top hip and knee a little forward, back to the neutral, and then a little back seeking to maintain the constraint that your face still looks forward. You don't roll to the floor, you don't roll to the ceiling. The top knee doesn't lift away from the bottom knee. You're just creating a small, subtle, I often refer to it as gliding and sliding, but it's a horizontal movement, small. And that's a translational movement. Now feel how far up through you you notice a resonance in your spine simply by initiating gliding and sliding the top hip and knee in relationship to the bottom. You pause as you need to and now here's a question. What did it feel like on the bottom leg? Did it seem like the bottom leg was moving in relationship to the top leg while you were initiating the movement from the top? Could you go back to that movement that you just did with your leg, but think about the relationship with the bottom leg on the floor? And in your mind's eye, every time you go to translate the top hip and knee a little forward of the bottom, could you think that the bottom hip and knee is translating a little bit backwards in relationship to the top leg? Then both legs can join together in your neutral. And when you intend to glide and slide a little in a translational movement, the top hip and knee a little back, could you think that the bottom hip and knee on the floor is gliding a little forward, translating with the top leg in opposition? It's more a state of being. It's happening. And all you need to do is, if you think you're working hard to do it, is just give up the work and dream it. Just notice what's happening. And now if I said, you know that translation I shared with you of your head forward and back? You might put those pads there again in front of your face, behind your face, behind the back of your skull. If I said, could you add in the translation of your face forward and then back on top of the arm, and then back. And you coupled it with your hip and knee, or hips and knees. Which direction would you move your top hip and knee as you translate your head forward, back to the neutral, and then you translate the head back? All the while, you are looking forward. It's a translation. You just reduce the range so that you do not begin to intentionally, to go bigger, change the plane of action you are in, or you notice you did. And then leave that alone, roll to your back, and rest. Notice your contact. 
No one ever shared with me this was a translational movement. I just started reading and studying and playing lessons, and I went, well, yes, this is. If we do it small enough, our structure will clarify what is the appropriate range of motion to maintain that same plane of action. Now slowly, come up to sit. And just notice as I share, come to sit, what you'll choose to do. Good. So for the most part, I'm seeing different variations. Some have their legs long in front, straight. Some have their legs crossed. Some have soles of feet together, side sitting. If you have your legs straight, please spread them. That's it. Feel the difference. In fact, everybody straighten your legs and spread them like a V for victory. But how wide? Just comfortable for you, that you feel you can sit really comfortably. And then if it is, if it is within your ability with ease, please lean back on your hands or fists. If you feel I want to put some pillow or pads or towels to help because you're going to lean into your hands comfortably, please do so. And now slowly, look at where you're looking. Where is your head? And think, in whatever orientation your head is right now, that there is a plate that's resting underneath your chin. And for most of you, I see your head is relatively in the vertical. You're looking at your horizon. So if you want to just double check for yourself, take one of your hands away from the floor and place it like a, a flat hand underneath your chin so that you can really feel, oh yeah, I can tell you there are a lot of models. I had a girlfriend who was a model and she would always do this, always do this to keep that sense of being erect and upright. So it's a clarification, where are my eyes on my horizon? Now slowly. Make a little movement. And I'm going to joke, I did it the other day, what creature, many do this, but what creature comes to mind if I asked you to move your face, your nose, in the same plane of action, parallel to the floor, a little forward, and then back? What creature does this? And this is a translation. Feel that your spine moves a little bit, that there's a little bit of a pressure in your hands. And there are a lot of creatures that feed themselves like this. Chickens, roosters, deer, dogs. Now go ahead and change where your head is. Maybe tip it down a little bit. You still have a plane of action. It's a little diagonal, right? Continue to make this transition, this, this translational movement in this plane. It's a little diagonal. Think of how a chicken pecks its head down into the field for grubs and insects. But the direction of the front of your chin and the back of your skull stays on the same alignment, a little diagonal. It's still a translation. Now slowly, turn your head a little to one side or the other and stay there. And do that same movement, whether the chin is parallel to the ground, or it's a little above or a little below the level of the ground, and do the same transitional movement. What's different in one shoulder blade compared to the other? And then go ahead and you can change the way you sit. 
and continue making this translational movement of your skull in relationship to the rest of you. You know, a chicken doesn't only move their head forward and back because they're eating. So they move that head, but it is a forward and back movement, whether it's on a diagonal plane or a parallel plane. And just feel what else throughout your spine responds and allow it to move. Just reduce the movement. It doesn't have to be big. And then leave that alone. Lie on your back and rest. Notice your contact with the floor. Now, for some people, it may not be as available. Maybe for some people, what would make it a little bit more available is to bring your feet to stand. But if I asked you right now, feel where your back of your head is resting on the floor. And what does that have to do with the relationship of where your eyes look and where your chin is? Does the back of your neck and the front of your throat feel equal. And now, maybe as you exhale, could you just ever so small lift your head away from the floor and then bring it back to the floor? Translating your head in this orientation. Where does something throughout the rest of you need to depress or lean gently into the floor to facilitate you could lift your head away, maintaining the same plane of action. That's it. Just listen to how you breathe. And if you feel, oh, there was some strain in my neck, just imagine it. Do less. You can even notice when you go to imagine doing something, are you already holding your breath? Are you already anticipating your habitual habits of difficulty, of it hurts? What if, what if, when you were an infant, mommy had, or daddy, had their hand behind your skull, and they ever so gently just began to lift your skull an eighth of an inch away from the floor, That's the translation. Were you doing more than that? Maybe it's just thinking about how your chin, your nose, leads towards the floor. Um, uh, leads towards the ceiling and then back towards the floor. Keep asking, can I reduce the amount I'm doing so that it feels this is easy? Or then you do it in your imagination. And you notice even to imagine, does it not feel easy? Then do one and rest and dream it, make believe it. Or do something that makes you giggle and laugh like it's a chicken going burk, 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 burk. There are many, many different cultures that use the movement of the head this way. But then they also think about moving the head from side to side. And notice, because we have a spine and there are no straight lines, there's a subtle little curve. But as long as you keep your face forward, you just do less, and you notice there's a little arcing. And then pause and rest from that. Notice your contact. Now, bring your feet to stand. Find that place where your feet stand. You feel the potency of them. And everybody has to feel for yourself. Where is it for me if I have difficulty in my knees? 
Do I need to have some kind of attraction on the floor so my feet don't slide away? Am I bracing and gripping with my toes or can they be soft but they're grounded? What is the sensation of skeletal support where the muscles work efficiently but not overwork that fatigue us? Very slowly go back to that luxuriating movement of tilting your pelvis, tilting it up and then down. You're just revisiting what we often refer to as the 12 o'clock and the 6 o'clock. And notice this is not a translational movement. We're doing something else. But we're going to use this movement to bring us into another exploration. And I, I hope that this is a movement that becomes a regular known in your life. That you do it small, gentle, without trying to fix or demand. Just where is it so nice that it doesn't create a rippling effect of, of, you know, when a speedboat goes past and it creates a chop, waves that really can jar the next person in a little sailboat or a little, a little catamaran. No, nice and soft. Be soft and gentle to your skin, tissue, and bones to feel more. Sort of like the princess and the pea. And now very slowly begin to depress when you've tilted your pelvis in one direction in such a way that you can begin to lift your pelvis into the air riding up your spine. Do it easy. Don't try to do your best. Just where it's easy and the going up, lifting the pelvis up and the lowering the pelvis down feels really nice. And you do many approximations so that the lift and the lowering is as, af is as if you could think that you are slowly lifting one pearl on a string of pearls. That would be a vertebra. And then another pearl. And you're just playing with this. It's called spine like a chain. We've done a whole series on this. and you find your ease and listen to the relationship that starts to happen as the pelvis lifts with the relationship in your spheres your pelvic bowl your rib basket and your head there's a relationship they are moving in relationship to each other now when those of you that are exploring find that you didn't do your best you didn't go all the way up and you're not sitting all the way up at C7. But there's a sense that there's a line that is developed from your knees to your thighs to your pelvis that it is a straight line. There's a straight line. You haven't gone the highest you could but you've gone where you can sort of hang and you feel like, okay, there's a diagonal line. If there was a dowel stick put up my knees, down my thighs, through the front of my hips, into my belly, into my ribs and my chest, it would be pretty much a straight line. That's what I'm asking you to find. Okay? For some, you'll just imagine. Once you go and you find that, stay there. Listen to how you breathe. And then you lower down. Now, someone else used a wonderful approximation. They went, I want to lift my pelvis, but I want to give up some of the work to hold it there. So they went and they got a roller. And they placed a roller underneath the top of their sacral bone. If you have a roller and you want to try that, you could. But you don't need to because for the person who's using the roller, they're going to have to explore a little with coming away from the roller because I'm going to ask you, once you get that alignment where you haven't gone the farthest you could go, but you got that place where you're sort of hanging out, then could you translate your pelvis from one side to the other? And this is when I'm going to remind you of that little joke 
about the old-fashioned typewriter. Your pelvis just became the cartridge and you are typing and your pelvis as the translational movement like that cartridge glides over to the left and then as if it went all the way to the left where it's comfortable you took your hand and you hit it on the lever that slid that, tri that typewriter cartridge over to the right so that you could start typing again. But it's a transitional translation movement. And notice, could you imagine that your pelvis is resting on a flat surface, like a table, and you're simply sliding your pelvis from side to side, keeping the same plane of action. Yeah, some of you can just lift a little and drag your pelvis side to side on the floor, barely touching the floor, but just enough that you're maintaining the same plane. Wonderful modification. Now, come down from that and rest, because many of you have been exploring this spine like a chain and beginning to find it where you need to rest. Because I know that legs get tired. We tire, so rest. And your rest will give you an indication if you needed to rest sooner than later. Do you just sink into the floor like, oh, yeah. Or, ah, there's a little bit of activation that needs a little bit more time to settle in. Or I need to do some of that 12, 6 o'clock because I activate it and it's not quieting. And slowly again, let's compare. Bring your pelvis up again slowly. How far you take it, you're finding ways to explore. The next time you get your pelvis in the air, and you're going to begin this translational movement, don't. Actually do it in such a way that you are going to rotate the pelvis a little, meaning one foot pushes a little bit more and one side of your pelvis lifts a little closer towards the ceiling and the other one dips a little bit more towards the floor. I'm asking you to actually do that. That's it. And feel that's a rotation. It's a lovely movement. But I'm going to ask the question, is that sort of what you were doing before? See, you have to compare. And then see if you can reduce the movement so that you literally translate, like that old-fashioned typewriter cartridge. Slide your pelvis a little to one side and to the other. And if you try to do too big of a movement, you can't help but rotate because all of those paraspinal muscles between each vertebra and all of the ligaments and tendons, they can only move so far in this translational movement. So you do less instead of more. and then bring everything down and rest. Notice your contact with the floor. Listen to your breathing. And now place your arms out to the side, 90 degrees with your torso, palms face up. And the smallest amount, the smallest amount, begin to feel that there is something to the right of you. And you're going to use your right arm to slide a little further to the right. And then you're going to come back. Feel what happened in your shoulder blades, in you. And then use the left arm and slide it to the left. But think that there's something there you want. Is it a tissue? But don't go grab it so that you change the shape of your hand. 
Make sure you roll your head to look, are my arms really at 90 degrees? Or is my arm higher up than 90 degrees? As if you have a cross, a T, that the arms make on a horizontal plane, and your spine, the line of you, is the vertical. And do the movement of translating an arm out to the side, and then the other one. But you're not using the the rotating fists, because I don't want the rotation. I just want a translation of your arms this way and that way. And feel how it draws through you. And you might think, if you don't let your head roll from side to side, your head will begin to translate a little too. As if you were a Thailand person from Thai, Thailand, and you were doing some Thai dancing. Or maybe you were from a country in the Middle East, Occidental, and you're doing different types of dancing where you translate the head, the skull, the face, the arms, and feel how below something is moving because there are no straight lines. There's a response. You just reduce the movement so that you can keep this plane of action the same. And rest. Now for those of you that are so inclined, I will offer another variation on your belly. Come to your belly. Place one hand on top of the other and turn your head to whichever side you feel. You feel it's easier for me. So that some side of one cheek or ear or the jawline is resting on one of the back of the hands. And notice which hand you put down first. And notice if you can see the elbow in front of you. And now slowly begin to take your head looking at the elbow in front of you. As you exhale, lift your head the smallest amount so that you could transfer, translate your head along one forearm as if you wanted to go in the direction of the elbow in front of you. And then as you come back, translate the back of your skull in the direction of the elbow behind you traveling along that forearm. And even though the intention is you are translating your face forward, then the back of your skull back, you maintain the same plane of action. If you notice it starts to change, do less. Do a smaller movement. Don't strive to achieve getting to the elbow. It's the direction. And rest as you need. And if you are thinking that everything else through the center of you needs to be a straight, vertical axis that you don't let move, God help you. Notice that your pelvis wants to respond. And allow your pelvis to respond. You are translating your head, your face. But everything else will respond to enable so that you don't hurt yourself. And now slowly, turn your face so that your forehead rests on the hands. You would be looking down. Find a way that you can house your forehead on the hands. And now think. You're hearing, your ear. What do I hear? And begin to translate your right ear a little over to the right, listening. What just drew my attention? But your face stays face down. Maybe your nose slides a little bit on the wrist or the forearm. Then bring the face back so the forehead can rest down. And then translate your left ear, just hurt something. And translate that left ear over to the left a little. The cervical spine can only move so far. So you keep it tiny. But now you're looking face down. And you just lift the head just enough so that you don't bruise your nose. You can keep breathing. 
You don't come away from this variation like a boxer. You just took a hit in the nose. And if you notice here too, to translate one ear towards one side and then the other one, your pelvis wants to move by all means allow. And then slowly lift your head just enough that you can turn your head to the other side. When you turn your head to the other side, maybe try changing which hand is on top of the other. You want to recognize why we go with the pattern we go with. It's familiar. There's some ease to it. This isn't the side you chose, so maybe your head doesn't turn as easy. Don't go where it's uncomfortable. Modify. And once again, just the smallest amount, lift your head and translate so that your face now goes towards, in the direction, a little bit, in the direction of the elbow you can see or the one you now know is in front of you. And then slowly, as you bring your skull back, you, you keep going further back. And you take the back of your skull in the direction of the elbow that is now behind you. And anything through your pelvis, your legs, you feel, wow, I want to I wanna play with that. It feels nice. It makes it easier to allow this constraint, this intention of translating my face or the back of my skull. You do it. Yes, lovely. I see wonderful modifications occurring, and I'm so happy to see them because you're listening to yourself. You're feeling yourself, sensing yourself, thinking about it, and then doing from what's already wired in, from your learning. And then let that go, roll to your back, and rest. Notice your contact. And if I said of all the variations we played with, the first one we were on the side, exploring with the pelvis, the upper pelvis and knee, but then I brought in the idea of the bottom side. We also stayed on that side, and there was the translation of moving your face forward and back, still looking forward. And then we connected those two, the upper and the lower spheres in this trans translational movement. We played on the back. We played sitting. I think sitting was the next one. And the pecking of your head. We changed trajectory of your head, but still kept that translational movement. As an animal does. A deer feeding. A chicken. A rooster. My dogs. We played a little bit of spine like a chain, but when we lifted the pelvis, not to the highest amount, but just where it was really creating a diagonal straight line to transition the pelvis in a translation movement, side to side. Then we played again, revisiting briefly the belly. They were all translations. And I hope none of them were lost in translation. Slowly, think about all of the different ways to explore. Some might have been simpler for you, clearer. Other ones, not so clear. Just let it settle. Let it assimilate and integrate. And slowly, Roll by way of one side. Transition yourself to come from sitting to stand.
And once you've come to your vertical, let your arms rest. Just notice what you notice. And that's what's so important. The end of a lesson is not the end of the lesson unless that's what you make it. There is a minimum of an hour if you allow. You don't jump right back into your habits, your I got to do, that your brain is beginning to allow this to integrate and wire in. If you rush it, you could fry your brain. You could lose the information. But you can come back and find it again. So we always share at the end of any Feldenkrais, whether it is an awareness through movement lesson, a guided mentoring, a functional integration, hands-on when we come back to that, live and in person, or a virtual, whatever the names we're going to start giving them. Allow your brain and nervous system the time, because it took you a little outside of your known, and feel what it did for you. And then once or twice, can you think of what a translational movement would be while you are standing? You could replicate any of the ones we already did. You could think of a chicken pecking. You could think of the deer looking to go eat something. It's still a translation. And then slowly have your walk, drink in whatever you are noticing, hopefully of good, of comfort, of ease, 